Hello, everyone. My name is Preston Teague, and I'm the Senior Director of Community Relations and Youth Football for the Buffalo Bills. Wanted to take an opportunity to introduce myself to all of you and wish all of you the best of luck as you return to the football field this fall. To help prepare you for your return to football, I sat down and spoke with Eric Ciano, the Buffalo Bills Head Strength and Conditioning Coach, to talk about different ways you can engage your kids in strength and conditioning in a fun, safe, and exciting way. Eric is an amazing coach and one of the best in the business. He's been with the Buffalo Bills for 11 seasons. Prior to that, he coached at the college level at the University of Tennessee, Georgia Tech, and Louisiana Tech. Eric played college football at Springfield College in Massachusetts as well. Eric, as I mentioned before, is one of the best in the business. In 2019, he was recognized by his peers as the NFL Strength and Conditioning Coach of the Year. We're very lucky to have Eric in Buffalo and uh, on this call with us today today to share some information with us. Without further ado, Coach Siano. Preston, I really appreciate it. And thank you guys for you know joining this Zoom call. Uh, hopefully I can give you guys some information that you take back to your programs or your kids and something that's gonna help you out you know, throughout this journey all the way through high school. So I'm gonna start right out with just going about you know, one of the benefits or a strength and conditioning program for uh, children and kids. Number one, we want to increase performance. I mean, that's our goal as a strength coach. We want guys to get bigger, faster, stronger. But at the end of the day, we want to improve them as an overall athlete. Now, on top of that, we want to help prevent injuries. Okay, so we talk to our athletes all the time about being available, you know, obviously, and being accountable. So doing the things that it takes to stay on the field so they can be successful. We want to improve motor performance. We want to improve power output. We want to get stronger. We want to improve body compositions. We talk about lean body mass. So we want to gain muscle. That's the things that are make us run faster, jump higher, be more explosive. So we want to gain lean body mass and then lose body fat. For children, super important. We want to improve self-esteem and confidence. We want a guy when he becomes, you know, a high school athlete, that he's confident in his abilities. He's confident in himself. He's strong. He knows he's strong. And that will help perform on the field. Uh, another one right now that's a big topic is weight loss. Obviously, we're always coming right now out of the coronavirus stuff. I have children myself. You'll see a little bit later here in the presentation. But as you're seeing, a year for a lot of these guys at home, not being able to work out, playing a lot of time on video games, kids are bigger. I mean, kids I've seen in one year's time, a year later, I could not believe how much weight these guys have got. So weight loss is a big one in children right now. Probably the most important one here, though, is in establishing a regular exercise habits that continue into adulthood. We want these guys to learn to enjoy working out so they carry it out throughout their entire life, which will hopefully help them live longer, you know, and be more successful. Uh, some of the stuff that we talk about, um, children can gain 30 to 50% strength gains in eight to 10 weeks. Um, that's usually generally those kids that are just started working out. They're going to see huge improvements at the beginning, but also they found that these kids get better grades in school. We found a study that showed that A-level students who weight trained three to four times a week got A's. Guys that trained on an average three times a week got B's, and guys that were only two times a week got C's. But the thing to that that sticks out is that comes down to routines and habits. So if you're training three to four times a week, that means you have a program, you have a plan, and that's what's brought you to success. So that's why there's, you know, those students that are A-level students have a plan, and they probably do the same thing in school when they're in class as well. But I thought that was a very interesting fact. Um, so why should children start training at an earlier age? If I start earlier, they can accumulate training years so they can reach a higher level of athleticism sooner. So basically a kid that starts at seven or eight years old, by the time he turns 17, has 10 years of weight training experience before some of these other kids ever pick up a barbell or a weight. So that's a huge benefit to those kids. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that entails. But if I'm starting earlier, I'm going to gain a big advantage on my competition. Now, rule of thumb, beginning at seven or eight year old, seven or eight years old is appropriate. Now, we're going to talk about what that means or training at seven or eight years old. Um, things to decide, though, when you want to decide if your kid is ready for a training program. So basically, is he mature enough? Is he able to follow directions? And does he have the adequate balance and proprioception? If he doesn't have those things, then obviously he's not ready. When I have my own children, I have twins right now that are 14 that you'll see in some of these pictures. We probably didn't start till they were seven or eight. You know, at six, they weren't ready, but I have a six-year-old now who is ready, but seven or eight-year-olds that time were too immature, couldn't follow directions. So we had to wait until they were ready to be able to start a training program. All right. 
when training things to consider all right when training program for kids and children all right number one focus on learning technique all right we always use the expression crawl before you can walk uh when i started with my own kids we started with a, a broomstick and we taught technique and everything started with body weight all right we had to be able to master our own body weight before i would ever load my children okay so we started out we'll show later in the presentation we went from body weight squats to goblet squats to front squats. I didn't let them back squat, put a bar on their back until they were 13. And that's when they could prove that they could you know, handle those demands at that age. Uh, training for kids needs to be serious, but fun. If it's boring, they're not gonna wanna do it and you're gonna lose them and you're not gonna be able to get them back, okay? We also need to work on improvement movement patterns. Kids these days play a lot of video games, phones. They're not like when we were kids. They're not running and jumping and throwing and hopping and you stay outside till mom blew the whistle or, you know, rang the bell and came into the house. They're not doing those things anymore. They don't have gym class every, any, every day. So we need to do is work on those movement patterns, jumping. I mean, those things are just not heard of anymore. And I see it in my neighborhood alone, like kids aren't outside as much as they should be anymore because of the, such of the video games and phones. All right. Programs should be individualized. It's got to be based on age, size, maturity, and personal goals. I'm not going to do the same thing for an eight-year-old that I'm doing for a 14-year-old, okay? So you got to make sure you take that account when you're designing a program, all right? When you're talking about earlier children, okay, before puberty, they're going to gain strength through neural adaptations. You're not going to see the physical development when they're younger. That's not going to hit till after they, you know, go through puberty. Also, be careful with competitive Olympic and powerlifting, okay? When the kids are younger, I don't want my kids Olympic lifting, maxing out, or powerlifting, maxing out. Let their bodies physically mature before you guys get into that. We want to make sure that their bodies are ready and we don't damage them for later in life. At those points and that part of life, we want to be focusing on technique, more reps, and doing things correctly instead of maxing out, okay? Children like intervals, short bursts of exercise. They like things that are quick and fast. They don't like long-distance stuff or long repetitive things. So reasons why injuries occur in training, all right? Number one, inappropriate weight you know, used. Two, poor lifting progression. There has to be a plan in what the athletes are doing, okay? Improper technique, that's a huge one. Misuse of equipment. You know, a lot of equipment is not made for younger children, so they're not, it's not made for them, that's how they get hurt. But the last one is probably the most important one, inadequate supervision. So coach to athlete ratio. When I go into a gym and see athletes training, I want to see how many coaches they have per athlete. That's where kids get better. When there's more, co more coaches to less athletes, they get more individualized attention and you're going to see more success. When you get in large groups with only one coach, that guy has to be a really, really good coach to be able to monitor that entire room. So you want to see more coaches or smaller. If you're going out to the private sector, and hiring guys to train your children, you want to make sure that the athlete to coach ratio is good. Okay. Um, keys to program design, train for the demands of the sport. Okay. So I wouldn't train my cross country runner the same way that I would train my football player. Train for the demands of the sport. If I'm training high school football, okay, you know, our core lifts are going to be cleans, squats, bench, where if I'm in cross country, they're going to be very different. The other one also is to keep it simple. Okay. People try to get too complicated in their programming instead of doing what they know well, okay? Keep it simple and you'll see your kids progress. Also coach what you know. You can't just find something on the internet and decide that you're gonna do that that day. If you don't know how to coach it, it shouldn't be in your program, okay? Keep things simple. Also make sure your facility is conducive to your program. So if I'm a high school strength and conditioning coach and I have back squat in my program, but I only have one squat rack, that's not going to work. That's not conducive to you being successful. Okay. So you got to make sure that the program you design, you have the equipment necessary to perform. Okay. Know your athletes and make changes where needed. Okay. Here's a big one. I was a young strength coach when I got in the field and thought that everybody was made to back squat. Not everybody type is made to back squat. All of my athletes do versions of squatting, but not every guy is made to back squat. Some guys have long torsos, short lower bodies. Those guys tend to, uh, do better with front so uh, front squat. Uh, some of our athletes with longer legs, short toes, also tend to do better with trap bar deadlifts. So do not try to uh, jam a square peg in a round hole. So make sure some guys aren't made to squat, period. Some guys are going to be single leg squat guys. But make sure you know your athletes. And the most importantly, don't rush the process. Take the time. Do it the right way. You'll see better gains 
all right, later on. Don't ever chase numbers and testing and stuff. Like, take the time to build the athletes the right way, and you'll see better results in the long run. So how do I design or how would you design an off-season program? Number one, I start with a calendar. Okay, I count backwards from, let's say, the start of our football season, basketball season, whatever season it is, and count backwards. So then I also look at how many holiday vacations. You know, I don't want to have a training day when I know this upcoming weekend is Memorial Day on Monday for us. I don't want to have a workout day on that day when I know that my kids are not going to be in school and I'm not going to be able to train with those guys. Okay, now if you have spring practices in your sport or you have other sport conflicts, if in high school, I know a lot of guys play multiple sports, Make sure you have to look at that. What are your team's needs? Do we need to get bigger? Do we need to get stronger? Do we need to get faster? Do we need to improve in conditioning? I've got to make sure my program addresses all of those areas. How many days a week are we going to train? You know, are we three days a week? Are we four days a week? What is our format? So are we going to be upper body, lower body? Are we total body three days a week? What is the format of your program going to be and how is it going to fit your facility? What exercises fit your pools for your facility? And if you're, let's say, a high school athlete and you guys are going to test, what exercises are you going to test? You know, is it hand clean? Is it back squat? Is it bench? And whatever you are going to test, you got to make sure you're training those exercises so you have success. Make sure your program has overload. Basically, prioritization, you have a plan, okay? You have a plan to be successful over that off-season program or in-season program. Another one also is do not forget about download weeks. You can't train heavy every week, okay? So throughout your plan, there has to be weeks where you download weeks. And generally, as a, as a college strength coach my previous year, we would also use the holiday weeks as our download weeks because we're going to have school in those days anyway. So we always use uh, holidays for our download weeks. Um, and then if you're going to have a conditioning test, you know, what is that test? And if it is, it has to be part of your plan and it has to be practiced so your guys have success for the conditioning test. So uh, I put together some um, exercises for body weight exercises for you guys. So one of the ones here, I'll do this play. Um, so these are the things I talked about being able to master your body weight first. So I start out with body weight squats. And I'd start with a stick, as you see here. Then we go to overhead squats. And then we go into our lunging, lunging variation. So we do forward lunge, reverse lunge, lateral lunges, three-way lunges. Okay, these are great ones, especially with younger athletes to make sure that we can master these before I would ever load an athlete. We have to be able to master these safely before I would ever put a dumbbell, you know, or a vest on them or something like that. Let's click the next one in here. All right, some other ones, push-ups, all right, inverted row. This can be done with feet on the bench, feet on a box. You could just use a bar, have the bar set for um, bench press position and you just pull your chest all the way up, to, all the way down. Uh, another one for core would be a plank series. And as you see that after coming off this coronavirus, you see that these would be 10 simple exercises that you can do when you don't have a lot of equipment available. We found this past year that we had to be able to do a lot more with a lot less. We had to find a way. And we preach that to our athletes all the time. Of, you had to find a way to get it done. Here's another example of pushups too. If your athlete can't do a pushup, you know, you're doing it from your knees to start. All right. Some of the other exercises I had. Double leg uh, glute bridge, we progress to single leg glute bridge. Uh, our hip series for glutes, okay, and hips, straight leg raise, side leg raise, okay, bent knee, uh, we call that fire hydrant, okay, then we do fire hydrant plus press, okay, so those are some other simple exercises that you can do with any athlete. All right, and then if you have some access to a gym, obviously pull ups and dips are two of my all time favorites. We do pull-ups overhead. We do chin-ups underhand. We do neutral grip, okay? If you have access to a dip rack, even better. But these are 10 exercises that I think are great body weight exercises for young athletes to do and, and, and have success. Um, I know Preston's got some questions that he wants to talk about. Some of the other stuff I want to make sure that I just kind of went over. I know he asked a little bit. I didn't get a chance to get to this today about, he asked about team warm-up. Uh, when we do our team warm-up, our team warm is generally about seven minutes for our guys. Uh, we start with dynamic warm up and we start from walking exercises into skipping exercises, into running exercises and lateral movement. Example, we would do, you know, walking knee tucks, walking toe grabs, Spider Man lunge, T spine, cradle walks, quad pull reach, walking high kick. And then we get into our skipping movements of A skips 
power skips, and then we go into lateral shuffles, karaoke, then we'll do some stiff legged bounds, and then we'll do a couple of accelerations, and then we'll do even more movements in place where we'll do body weight squats, um, good mornings, and then we'll do a few static stretches. We don't do a lot of static stretching before practice, do very little, but we do some. Um, and then, you know, obviously our static stuff is done at the end of practice with our guys. But I, I, I really uh, want to lean on Preston's questions because I know I was, this is going to a large group of, uh, you know, coaches, athletes, parents, and I wanted to make sure I got a chance to answer the questions that you guys had as well. So I'm going to let Preston uh, ask some of these and hopefully I've covered some or hopefully I can get to these. Thank you so much, Eric. This really, this information is great. And, and hopefully the, you know, the participating coaches find it very useful. Um, you know, I, I've mentioned this a few different times, but I, I truly believe that you guys are the best in the business, um, you know, throughout professional football and, and, and the, the insight you gave today is, is awesome. So I do have a few questions that came in from the Ontario Football Alliance. So, if, you know, if you could just um, answer them to the best of your ability, that'd be great. Um, okay. The first question that came in, um, if, if athletes are um, preparing for combine testing or um, to be recruited, what are some areas they should focus on when preparing for combine testing? Uh, for combine testing, obviously the one that everybody puts most stock in is the 40 yard dash. Um, for the 40 yard dash, uh, the biggest way to see improvements is really focusing on the first 10 yards. It's the safest and you're going to see the biggest uh, drastic improvement there. So your stance, your start, in the first 10-yard sprint is where you can make up the most ground. If you can master that, you'll run a great 40. In terms of the other tests, uh, the pro agility, the L drill, those are practice, all right? And, and that's just repetition. Now, there are some keys to some of those drills, but the more you practice those, the better you'll get at those, the better you'll be able to bend and touch the line and do some of those things. And obviously, the vertical jump, a standing long jump, along with the 40-yard dash, a lot of those are going to get better also as you get stronger. The stronger you are, the faster you're going to become, and tail is going to help those uh, combine tests as well. Great. Um, and this is a, you know, extremely important question. I think you touched on it, um, but just if you could reiterate uh, how important it is uh, to get rest and recovery in the training process. Uh, I, I can't say enough how much sleep aids in recovery. Uh, there's a bunch of studies out there that show that athletes that only get six hours a night sleep are like, 60% more prone to injury than guys that get seven, eight, and nine hours of sleep. So recovery is a huge topic right now. And, and the biggest two things for recovery, and everybody wants to say that it's Norma Tech and cryo chamber and all these other things. But really, at the end of the day, the best way to recover is sleep and nutrition. Those are the two most important things to recover, to perform, okay? We, we adjust our schedule here at the Bills. So our athletes can get enough rest at night. We actually probably start later in the day than most NFL teams for that reason. We want to make sure that our athletes are getting to bed at night and getting at least eight hours of sleep at night when they come in here for the next day for practice. Awesome. Um, another question, how important is incorporating mobility and agility training into a training program? Uh, I think that stuff is super important. I think it could also be tied into your workouts as well. I mean, now we do obviously our mobility stuff before we work out, lower body days, those kind of things. But we also tie a lot of our mobility stuff into the workout. So example, we will, let's say bench press, but then we'll superset ankle mobility in between it. So there's our rest time on the bench, but we're doing our mobility exercise in between it. Or we may do uh, back squat and we're doing T-spine mobility in the middle of it. So there's other ways to tie your mobility work into your lifting program well where it is part of your rest periods. Um, you know, this is a very you know topical question with everything going on, not only in the States, but, um, you know, in Canada. You know, what advice do you have for kids who during this time may not have access to their regular gym facility or training staff? What are some things they can do, um, you know, on their own at home? Uh, things that you can do on your own, body weight exercises, uh, and for children, athletes especially, sprinting. Now, I'm not saying go out all out sprint the first day or whatever else, but you want to be able to go out and sprint. Sprinting generates six times body weight. Sprinting is one of the best things that you can do for injury prevention, speed improvement, a simple thing. So it's basically just being able to go outside and run. And during the coronavirus with our athletes, that's what we stressed all the time. We called them bulletproof exercises. And they were basically 
going out and performing exercises that were going to help protect us from injury. All right. And they were sprinting, squatting, taking care of our hamstrings, doing those kind of things. I mean, you can get enough done outside that you can be well on without a weight room facility. Some of the body weight exercises I showed in that video, along with running and sprinting. Another, another topical question. A lot of the, you know, the athletes, uh, you know, in these football programs haven't played in over a year. So, you know, what are some of the most important things for players that, that have been off, whether it's strength and conditioning, playing, you know, whatever physical activity, they've been off for an extended period of time. What are just some tips of, of kind of easing their way back into um, the, the process and the program? Um, we saw that here with my own children too. I mean, the biggest thing that you could stress is before your season occurs is getting in the best shape possible that you can to help prevent injury. On top of that, focusing on some other areas where guys haven't had contact in a long time is focusing on the neck and trap area to help with the concussion stuff because that's a lot of guys haven't tackled in a long time. So it's going to be a little bit different as well as some of the shoulder stuff because the body is just not used to that contact at this time. But uh, I think getting in the best physical condition before a football season will be the most beneficial thing for you. And with that comes in, what we just talked about sprinting. All right, guys are getting injured when they're not used to that level of load. So if they're not prepared for that load of practice, that's when guys get hurt because they're just not physically ready. So if you can do a better job of getting in shape, that will help prevent that during that time. And then just, you know, a couple of quick questions, um, final questions. If there was one thing that you could recommend for a program's strength and conditioning initiative, what would it be? One piece of equipment or just doing one thing? One piece of advice. Like what, 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 what's the number one rule in a program? What's your number one rule for a program when they're incorporating their strength and conditioning? I think you have to, I would say it have to know your athletes. I mean, every athlete is different. Every athlete is built different. Every athlete's needs are different. So, you know, we have a lot of individualized programs here and it's done, it's, it's because of the uh, athletes individual needs. Some guys need to gain weight. Some guys need to lose weight. Some guys have to get stronger. Some guys have to be more explosive. I think it is finding out what that need is for that each individual athlete and then program accordingly. You know, we have so many different needs here, even, even at the bills, you know, that we have to program differently for all these guys so that they can be successful. And, you know, obviously by doing that for those guys, it lengthens their career. You know, it helps the Bills win. It makes them more money in the long run, does all those stuff things. But finding out what each individual athlete needs and then programming towards that. Perfect. Thank you. And just one final question, and this actually was for me, um, you know, is there for, for the parents, for the coaches, for the athletes, is there any websites or online resources that you can think of that you would recommend that, that people can go to, to to find additional exercises for youth of all levels, best practices, tips? Is there, is there, I know there's probably numerous, but is there one or two in, in general that you, that you advise people use on a regular basis? Uh, I mean, there are a lot of, there's a lot of websites, there's a lot of stuff out there. Uh, I would really recommend that you go to somebody that's a really credited strength coach, a guy that's been there and done there. I'm going to use, uh, you know, Mike Boyle in the Boston area who does a great job, uh, has a lot of private facilities, but also been a guy that was a head strength coach at Boston University, uh, the Boston Red Sox at times, but has a great philosophy and a great program for all ages and athletes. Uh, I think he would be a good resource for a guy that, you know, chain, trains children well and has, and has a real solid philosophy. So he would be a guy I would look up for sure. Well, again, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. I just have some some closing remarks. Um, you know, if you don't mind, just hanging on on the video for a sec, and, and we'll right. out. But Eric, I, I, thank you so much. This is no, awesome. thank you guys for having me. I really appreciate it. It's been a you know, so I I put my contact information in there. Uh, if you guys have any other you know additional questions or whatever else, please reach out to me. I promise I'll try to get back to you as soon as possible. Right now, we're in the middle of the off season, but like I said, I promise I will get back to you though. Awesome. Thank you so much, and and, and thank you again. Um, to the Ontario Football Alliance for, for having us participate in this virtual clinic. Hopefully all the participants get a lot of useful information out of it. You know, best of luck as you return to play. We're, we're really excited that, um, you know, the coaches are going to get back out on the field. The kids are going to get back out there. Their parents can watch them play. Um, you know, we love this sport so much, and, and we really can't wait to get back to, to playing football, um, whether it's flag, tackle, youth, high school, um, you know, we really look forward to getting you know, everyone back on the field throughout the world. Um, and, you know, just good luck to all of you. We, we 
again, also look forward to getting back up into Southern Ontario when the border reopens. It's a great part of our market. We have uh, thousands of fans in Southern Ontario. Um, hopefully, again, at some point, um, families and, and parents and kids are able to come down and watch us play at One Bills Drive um, at Highmark Stadium. But thank you guys so much for having us. Really appreciate it. Good luck to you uh, with your upcoming season and your preparation and have a great weekend.